periods, what the gush moments. But the right pad can. Only Always Ultra Thins have rapid dry technology and they absorb 40% faster. The gush happens fast. That's why. Happening now. For the first time in this city's history, San Antonio will host the entire NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament with help from the surrounding area. We have a live report coming up. Senate Democrats take the next step towards fast tracking a COVID-19 relief bill. When that could be passed and why they may not need Republican support coming up. Another downtown homeless encampment cleanup today. What the city says was the issue with this one and what Mug Man says he's going to do now. And I know for a lot of us, it's been a cloudy and cool Friday, but we're going to see a lot more sunshine this weekend. I'll have your forecast for you coming up. What's the room in your house that has the most bacteria? It could very well be your kitchen. Coming up, simple things you should be doing to keep your family healthy. The news at five starts right now. At first at five, we are waiting to hear from investigators about the latest in the search for the man who's accused of shooting Balcones Heights Police Sergeant Joey Sepulveda earlier this week. The Bear County Sheriff's Office expected to provide an update sometime this evening. Last night, Sheriff Javier Salazar said one of the suspects, 30 year old Sigifredo Montemayor, was taken into custody in Mexico. We now know that he has been extradited to Bear County and is now in BCSO custody. At last check, investigators were still looking for the man who allegedly pulled the trigger, 27 year old Wilfredo Montemayor. Both men, brothers, expected to face charges of attempted capital murder. We are waiting for that news conference to begin and we will bring it to you live once it does. Also new at five, the city of San Antonio taking down another downtown homeless camp this morning. This one on Main Street next to I-35, where the city says that it posed a safety concern. Garrett Berger tells us this cleanup comes amid resistance to this tactic by one city councilman in particular. In the space of half a morning, a downtown tent town was no more. And it's the second time that I, I didn't been in this situation. Only thing they're going to do once again is scatter us like ants. The city says outreach teams have come through this camp several times in the past few weeks, offering help connecting to services and also warning that an abatement, as the city calls them, was coming. This cleanup comes two days after another at Brooklyn and I-37, a little more than a mile walk away. The cleanup earlier this week, the city says, was mainly about criminal activity. This one, safety concerns. Tents right close to a drop on the I-35. We will leave a camp in place if there's no health or safety concern, if there's no suspected criminal activity, we would not abate it. The city says before they clean camps out like this, outreach teams try to connect people to things like shelters or detox. Today, they say only three were interested in shelter services. One of them, a young pregnant woman who went with Sam Ministries. We're going to connect her with um, a shelter for the next 48 hours while we get her on a pathway to housing. But the camp abatement approach has its critics, like Councilman Roberto Trevino, who was outside his own field office this morning, where he expected one there. We will come in and sweep an area, but then nobody knows where these people go next. And, and that's not the right approach. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. In regard to the possible cleanup of a camp at Trevino's office, the city manager said he has agreed to let people sleep there for the next two to three weeks. The city will work with its partners and the councilman's staff, he said, to help connect people with services. For the first time in the history of college sports, San Antonio will host the entire NCAA women's basketball tournament from the second round to the finals, sharing venues with Austin and Sam Marcus to tip off the first round. With more on the story, Let's head over to our Greg Simmons. Greg, a big announcement today. This is huge for the city. This unprecedented move to host the entire women's basketball tournament that features 64 teams comes after the NCAA did this exact same thing with a men's tournament in Indianapolis during the COVID-19 pandemic. The venues in San Antonio will include the Alamo Dome, the UTSA Convocation Center, St. Mary's Bill Grehe Arena, with the Alamo Dome configured for two courts beginning with the first round of play on March the 21st and the 22nd, sharing with Frank Irwin Center in Austin and the University Events Center in San Marcos with second round play shifting entirely to venues in San Antonio from March the 23rd to the 24th with all the championship rounds starting with the Sweet 16 on March the 27th and 28th to the Elite 8 March the 29th and 30th and the Women's Final Four April the 2nd through the 4th all in the Alamo Dome. The experience that San Antonio has with NCAA championships and, and, and frankly it's uh, for large-scale large events. 
Um, so within that, though, at, when we announced in December that we were, in fact, going to one geographic area and exploring the San Antonio region, um, that was tied to the fact that San Antonio had been a, had been um, named as the host for our women's final four. So throughout that exploration, and it was the can-do attitude, it was certainly <laughs> in most just every single instance about how it could happen Right now, no decision on fan attendance has been made, but whatever policy is adapted will then follow the local established health and safety protocols. More on this huge event coming up in sports. I think the NCAA made a great decision, it Greg. Sure did. Yeah, let's go to other news now. New at 5. After nearly five months, the family of Daryl Zamalt watched the body cam footage of his fatal shooting. Zamalt shot by an SAPD officer back in September of last year. Zamalt's daughter spoke with the crowd after watching that video, thanking them for their support. She did not comment on what she saw on the video, but joined the crowd in a moment of silence in honor of her father. The shooting happened while police were serving two domestic violence arrest warrants to Zamalt. To Zamalt. Police Chief William McManus said Zamalt allegedly grabbed the service weapon from the holster of another officer he was wrestling with. None of the officers involved have been charged. SAPD submitted the case to the district attorney's office for an independent investigation. New details in the murder of a man on the city's east side. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office identifying the victim as 52-year-old Eugene Perry Howard. Police found him dead with three gunshot wounds to the torso in the front yard of a home in the 4300 block of Skelton Drive. That was on Wednesday night. Investigators believe one or more people walked up to Howard while he was in his car and shot him. At last check, police have not made any arrests in this case. The firefighters finding themselves in a race against nature at the scene of a house fire. Crews arrived in the at the house in the 1300 block of Schley Avenue on the city's southwest side. It was about 3.30 this morning, not just to fight the fire when they arrived, but also the wind. 20 miles per hour wind made containing the flames a tough job. Investigators say the home where the fire started had already been destroyed. We knew that main house was was already gone when we got here. So we, our main goal is to protect the other two houses on either side. Crews are able to knock down that fire in minutes. Investigators believe the fire originated in a kitchen, but they don't know what exactly started it. The home was empty at the time. Luckily, no one hurt in all this. The Senate approving a budget resolution early this morning. It's a key step towards fast tracking the passage of President Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief plan. As ABC's Andrew Dembert reports, Democrats were able to pass the motion without any support from Republicans. Today, Senate Democrats forging ahead on COVID relief. We cannot underscore enough how much help the America needs during this awful crisis. Vice President Kamala Harris breaking a 50-50 tie after a grueling 15-hour session where senators got to vote on amendments to the White House's $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan that could shape what ends up in the final bill. The budget reconciliation bill that passed means Democrats can pass coronavirus relief without any GOP support. The vice president votes in the affirmative. The president and Democrats saying new signs of a weakening economy adds to the urgency of getting those $1,400 relief checks out to Americans, though there seems to be some wiggle room on lowering the income level for eligibility. It's very clear our economy is still in trouble. Biden holding his first in-person meeting with House Democratic leaders. Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying even though they don't need Republican votes, they are still open to bipartisanship. I hope that we can work together. Biden, who promised to work with Republicans and try to unify a politically divided Washington, now dismissing the significantly trimmed down proposal offered by 10 Senate Republicans. We're going to go smaller, so it's just going to take us a lot longer, like until 2025. That's the Republican answer right now. GOP leaders, meanwhile, outraged at Democrats for passing the massive bill that could ignore their input. They're not interested and doing the hard work it takes to build consensus. The Labor Department says employers added just 49,000 jobs in January, compared to cutting 227,000 jobs in December. But still, the economy is about 10 million jobs short of its pre-pandemic levels, which the White House says underscores the need to pass another round of COVID relief. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. 
The Biden administration is deploying 1,000 troops to help administer COVID-19 vaccines. The troops will form five teams that will deploy to sites around the country over the next several days. Defense officials and FEMA have discussed using up to 10,000 troops to reach the Biden administration's goal of administering 450,000 vaccines a day. The National Guard is already involved in its own effort to support more than 216 vaccine sites in 36 states with 20,000 of its troops. Taking a look outside with live cam, it has been a cool cloudy day for a lot of us, including here in San Antonio. But if you look off to the left side of your screen there, off to the west, there is some clearing. In fact, there's been a lot more sunshine west of I-35 today, and that's reflected in our weather watcher temperatures. So we've got 50s closer to the I-35 corridor, 65 in West Kerrville, but Del Rio made it up to 76 in Warren's backyard this afternoon. So much more off to the west where there's been some more sunshine. A bit closer to San Antonio, 54 in Windcrest, 55 in Universal City. Thanks to our weather watchers for calling in those temperatures on this Friday. I do expect a little bit of clearing as the evening goes on, but it won't be too long until clouds fill back in and we'll start off the weekend cloudy tomorrow morning, but don't worry. Plenty of sunshine on the way over the next couple of days. We'll talk about what you can expect for the weekend coming up in just a bit. Myra. All right. Thanks, Katie. He was best known for his role as Baron Von Trapp in The Sound of Music. Actor Christopher Plummer passing away today at the age of 91. ABC's Brandy hit with a look back at his lengthy career in showbiz. Christopher Plummer did not love the role that made him an international movie star. Do you mean to tell me that my children have been roaming about Salzburg dressed up in nothing but some old drapes? Mm -hmm. He played the strict Baron Von Trapp to Julie Andrews' Maria in the 1965 blockbuster The Sound of Music. The Sound of Mucus, Plummer is said to have called it, but he later warmed to the movie, as did his character to Andrews' character Maria. Edelweiss, Edelweiss. For a time, Plummer was typecast as a leading man, but it was as a character actor that he thrived. He played everything from a Klingon commander. This officer's record shows him to be an insubordinate, unprincipled, career-minded opportunist. To Rudyard Kipling and the man who would be king. I have to say that Peachy has gone south for the week. To journalist Mike Wallace in The Insider. Boy, I suppose I made some minor impact. I did a Iran gate and the Ayatollah. Plummer liked playing evil characters. The devil, he said, is more interesting than God. Here he is as an oil industry lawyer in Syriana. In this town, you're innocent until you're investigated. A critic once called the Canadian-born Plummer the finest classical actor in North America. Still, he never enjoyed the success on screen that he did on stage. He won two Tony Awards and was an accomplished Shakespearean actor. Asked once if he would ever retire from acting, he said retirement is death, and so he kept performing. You take upon yourself the duty of the Templars. Freemasons. He was, to borrow the title of this movie, a national treasure. Brandy hit ABC News, Los Angeles. A treasure. It's still ahead on the news at five. A look at your kitchen. All right, you may think it's clean, but is it really what to look out for and how to keep your family healthy? Next. What room in your house is likely to be the germiest? If you guess the bathroom, try again. There's a good chance it's actually your kitchen. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with simple ways to avoid food poisoning and keep your family healthy. Your hands are essential cooking tools, but they can spread dangerous bacteria that make you sick. Everything you touch, salt and pepper shakers, faucets, fridge handles, are common surfaces where germs can hide and spread. So food safety experts say you need to wash with soap and water anytime you switch tasks. Knives and items that touch raw meat, wash those with hot soapy water after every use. The juices that collect on cutting boards can contain E. coli and other dangerous bacteria that can make you seriously ill. Regularly, you can wash them with hot soapy water, but to get them really clean, use one tablespoon of unscented liquid bleach and a gallon of water. 
Raw meats, poultry, and seafood stored on the upper shelves in your refrigerator can drip and contaminate food below, so keep them sealed and on the bottom shelf. And use a refrigerator thermometer to maintain 37 degrees to slow bacterial growth. The freezer should be no higher than zero. And about that phone or tablet you have in the kitchen, it can easily pick up contaminants while you cook, so wash your hands often when you're checking that recipe. And a food safety note, meat and eggs aren't the only things you should cook before eating. Raw flour can carry salmonella and E. coli, so resist the urge to sneak the raw cookie dough. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. It's a hard urge to resist. I know. <laughs> cookie, right. to say no to cookie dough? Say no to cookie dough. Yeah. I've yet to meet a person who's done that. That's right. Some <laughs> helpful tips, though, for Marilyn there. All right. This has really been the story all day. It's just been a gray Friday. Yeah, we were hoping maybe we would already have started to clear out a bit more uh, by now. And I do think we'll see a little bit of clearing over the next few hours, but I don't think we're going to warm up much more than where we are right now. Uh, but as you saw with our weather watcher temperatures, those of you that have seen some sun today, uh, it's about 20 degrees warmer in spots. So a big spread in our temperatures today, uh, thanks to this cloud cover that has hung around for much of your Friday. So we are sitting at 54 at the airport under cloudy skies. The air is nice and dry winds east southeast just 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, we do have some more changes ahead. Obviously changes today as compared to yesterday. It was quite warm yesterday today. Quite cool out there. But as we get into the weekend, yes, another round of some weather changes ahead tomorrow. We're looking at a lot more sunshine and widespread afternoon temperatures in the 70s. So just keep your head on a swivel, not only uh, as we head into tomorrow, but also into next week. A lot to talk about here in the forecast. So you can see this gray here generally along an east of 35. That's the cloud cover. It has been slow to clear off to the east. So those of us that have been stuck under the clouds, we're in the 50s off to the west, some 60s and again, even some low to mid 70s well to the west off closer to the Rio Grande. Satellite loop again does show some slow clearing off to the east. So I do think we could uh, see a little bit, a uh, little bit of clearing this evening, but Obviously, once we get past sunset, the sun won't help to warm us up much at all. So uh, this evening, those clouds continuing to sneak off to the east and clear. But look what happens overnight by early tomorrow morning. Clouds roll back in, so we'll start off your weekend on a cloudy note. I do think there could be some patchy fog in spots tomorrow as well. Temperature wise, upper 30s in the hill country, everyone else in the mid to upper 40s. So a cool, cloudy start to the weekend, but we're going to clear out fast tomorrow, uh, especially late morning into early afternoon. There will actually be a weak frontal boundary moving in from the west tomorrow. This is going to help to kind of clear out all that cloud cover. If there's any fog in the morning, uh, this frontal boundary will move through. Clear that out as well. Look by lunchtime. A lot of us are seeing plenty of sunshine and then certainly by mid afternoon tomorrow, all the clouds are gone and it'll end up being a really nice day. Temperatures tomorrow again, more widespread 70s as compared to today. 72 here in San Antonio, some low to mid 70s on the coastal bend, low 70s up in the hill country tomorrow. So a uh, really nice weekend ahead despite how it will start early tomorrow morning with the clouds and even a little bit of patchy fog. Pleasant weather will continue into Sunday. Sunshine on Sunday with a high near 70. So overall, really good weather to get outside this weekend. Things will con continue to stay pretty warm as we get into early next week, Monday, Tuesday. High temperatures are in the mid 70s, but if you've been following the forecast, you do know we've had some colder air in the forecast for next week for the past several days, and it still does look like we are in for a fairly significant cool down at some point next week, but there's still a lot of timing as far as this cold air is concerned. So we'll take you through the weekend early next week. We're sitting in the 70s Sunday, Monday, likely even into Tuesday afternoon, but Tuesday is when things could start to get interesting. You see this front trying to sneak into North Texas some frigid air behind this frontal boundary. The question still remains when does this front reach South Texas and when will the colder air arrive for us? There's still a big spread as far as our weather models go. Uh, some bring them in, bring that colder air in Tuesday, some not until the end of the week as we get closer to Thursday and even Friday. So still a lot of questions regarding the cold air next week. We'll be uh, tweaking the forecast for you as our confidence grows. So do keep checking back over the weekend. But in the meantime, it's going to be really nice out there over the next couple of days, so do enjoy. Again, early tomorrow morning, if you'll be out cloudy with a little bit of patchy fog, then we clear out beautifully 72 tomorrow, 70 on Sunday, and staying unseasonably warm through early next week. And again, we expect that colder air to arrive sometime middle back half of next week. We'll keep you updated as there are still plenty of questions, but a little something for everyone in this planning forecast, I think. <laughs> yeah. <guys. laughs> All right. Thanks, Katie. All right, I said it earlier, I'm giving straight A's.
to the NCAA. Yeah, this is great because we've proven we can host these major events in a much improved Alamo Dome oh, atmosphere, yeah. but now it's going to even branch out even more with all 64 teams coming to our area. When we come back, with more details about hosting the NCAA Women's Tournament that just broke today, and the Spurs are in Houston ready to battle the Rockets. Coming up. As you heard at the top of our broadcast, San Antonio will host the entire NCAA Women's College Basketball Tournament, starting with the second round of the final sharing venues with Austin and San Marcos, starting with the first round of the 64-team tournament. San Antonio was already poised to host a women's Final Four for the third time after successful stints in 2002 and 2010. Now, for the first time, we'll get to host the entire tournament during the COVID-19 pandemic, starting with the first round on two shared courts in the Alamo Dome, the UTSA Convocation Center, and St. Mary's Bill Grehe Arena, also sharing venues in the first round with the Frank Irwin Center in Austin and the University University Events Center in San Marcos, home to the Texas State Bobcats. Reaction is pouring in for this unprecedented event. It'll be the biggest boom to San Antonio since the COVID-19 pandemic started last March. We said bring it on and um, we'll do anything that you that you need done, NCAA. Just tell us what you need. So I couldn't contain my excitement because this is just something that's never happened um, before. It likely will never happen again. And the fact that San Antonio gets to do it is, is pretty incredible. Sure is. Now, here's a look at the schedule starting in March, late March, the 21st and 22nd. They'll share the venues all the way down to the Frank Irwin Center and the University Event Center in San Marcos. Then the second round, the 23rd to the 24th, will be right here in San Antonio, sharing venues with UTSA and Bill Grehe Arena. And the rest of the playoffs, starting with a Sweet 16, will be held in the Alamo Dome all the way up to the Final Four, April the 2nd through the 4th. San Antonio Spurs in Houston where they'll face the Rockets tomorrow night following their big cover behind win against Minnesota on Wednesday. It's just what the team needed following consecutive blowout losses to the Memphis Grizzlies. This is just a one-game road trip for hosting the Golden State Warriors in back-to-back -back games Monday and Tuesday before embarking on their annual rodeo road trip that will feature seven stops over 15 days. It's also the first time the Spurs have faced the Rockets since splitting a pair in San Antonio on January the 14th and 16th. We know firsthand about how how well they play, uh, I mean, especially since the trade. I mean, they got a lot of guys that have done a lot of good things in this league, and, and they got a chip on their shoulder, and they're trying to prove themselves each and every night. So um, we have to be ready to go from the jump, and um, I mean, they're playing really well right now. All right, here's the matchup tomorrow night, early tip time, 7 p.m. All the highlights for you tomorrow night on the night beat and getting back to the NCAA Women's Tournament. The biggest question mark right now is will fans be allowed? Yeah. And so, how many fans at each venue? We'll keep you up to date on that as soon as we get the info. And a lot could change between now Abs and the yes. first tip off of that. Too. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Another look at the forecast your weekend will start off cloudy tomorrow morning, but we'll clear out quickly. Plenty of sun tomorrow afternoon and all the way through the day on Sunday. Again, we're still watching the potential for some much colder air to arrive middle back half of next week. Still some timing question marks, but we'll continue to keep you updated over the weekend and into early next week. Guys. All right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. And thanks so much for watching the news at five world news up next. We'll see you back here at six o'clock.